Welcome everybody and thank you for, for joining us today. We, we, we have already been uh, getting a lot of really great insights from, from the different conversations and uh, it, it has taken us in, in, in a number of, of directions around uh, the, the impacts in, in business and really uh, people and the human components um, and how technology can enable us. We're going to be chatting about um, uh, the impacts on, on society. Um, and uh, to, to do that, uh, we have a, a great panel jo joining us today. today. Um, in no order, uh, uh, Shalini Lal, uh, she's the founder of Infinity OD and on Cube. Welcome, Shalini. Uh, it's great to have you. Mr. David Cushman is the owner of Faster Future. Hello, David. Hi, um, good to see you all. Good to see you too. Uh, Roderick uh, Limbanda, uh, he's the founding partner of Case and he's joining us from uh, really far away, aren't you, Roderick? Yeah, Cape Town, South Africa. It's about 6 p.m. here. Yeah, all of a sudden, all of a sudden we're all very close together. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Igor Munoz. He's the founder of Zero, Zero Bullshit Management. Welcome, Igor. Hi, everyone. It's also 6 p.m. here in Krakow, Poland. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and of course, uh, Alex and I are going to be uh, uh, joining the conversation and, and chatting about these things. But um, as I was saying, we, we've had really critical and key insights uh, touching on everything uh, that goes from uh, the, the aspects of this pandemic, the, 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 the business components and, and the technology that, that powers it, but uh, I, I wanted to uh, perhaps, if, if we can focus on on the society uh, uh, aspects of, of the pandemic, and, and David, if we might uh, start start with you, uh, what are some of the big questions that come to your mind as we start to think about uh, the society components of the pandemic, uh, the things that are arising? What are the big questions that we should be asking today and into the future? Okay, well, there's obviously quite a lot. Uh, so trying to identify the key ones is a, a bit of a challenge, but um, I try to think of it in terms of the second and third order in impacts of what we're seeing now. Uh, and so you, you have simple things like um, the fact that so many people in the UK at least are working from home. Uh, so that's um, around 42 to 44% of people are, are working from home in the UK. And that's roughly half of those in the service sector, uh, which makes up 82% in the UK, so a massive part of uh, our economy. Um, and it's interesting, I, I spoke to my neighbour today, funnily enough, uh, and uh, he's um, he's been commuting to London for 24 years. And this is the first time he hasn't had to commute to London to do his job. And they've discovered, funnily enough, that they can do their jobs from home. Now. That's very exciting from a point of view of suddenly we get uh, loads of our day back, we get to um, have more of our time with our friends and family, we um, get to have less psychological damage done to us by the commute every day and all the stresses that you've went through, all those wonderful things. But there's a, there also has to be a recognition of two big impacts. One is um, if we don't go to the office, and I am hearing of very large organisations considering quitting the office full stop, uh, we don't go and buy sandwiches, go to the pub, go to the restaurants, uh, travel. There's so much economic devastation for people who cannot choose to work from home uh, as a result of that. So we have to think about how to manage that going forwards for a huge amount of people. There will be I mean, every business I know will be desperate to do this, to cut the office if they can, because it cut costs, and they're all in trouble right now, so I'm going to cut costs if I can. So there'll be a big pressure on that, there'll be a big pressure on automating absolutely everything you can, so again, a big pressure on jobs. And then you've got, actually, the impact on ourselves, because actually we have separate identities going on when we are at home and when we are at work, and we have benefits from that commute, um, which 
might be that bit of me time that we like to spend reading our book or listening to our music or staring out of the window. A lot of the things that we take for granted um, in part of the package of the bad, say, at the office are mm -hmm. actually quite positive. So, um, yeah, I think there's we have to look out for those second and third order consequences, start thinking about them now in order to better prepare society for the significant impacts. And that's just the office. That's before we talk about education or the law or the government or whatever else. But um, there's plenty of other fine folk that need to talk here, so I'm gonna shut up. No, no, thank you. Thank you for your insights and actually, uh, uh, so, something that that jumps on me from from what you're from what you're saying is uh, these uh, impacts and the cost of those impacts. Just thinking about working from home and the impacts on the pubs or the standard shop, uh, it, it will it will perhaps uh, breed a desire to bring things back to normal. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've been talking about normal, right? So so Igor. Uh, you, you, you had uh, in, in our previous conversations, uh, you, you had some thoughts around uh, that that innate desire to go back to normal. Would, would, would you touch on that a little bit, please? Well, the name of my company, Zero Bullshit Management, states everything about me. I'm a skeptic guy. So also on the previous panel, I've seen something, some expressions like we need to, we should, etc or we need to rethink we need to plan and my question always is well who <laughs> and how how should we prepare how should we foresee it and i'm actually well i see i see pretty much the same as you david here in poland like the people who can the the white collars let's call let's call let's call them they 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 just stay at home they work from home but the blue collars cannot uh, but also the white collars are also freaking out in their homes. And as I'm as I'm talking with many people, the first problem are children at home. You know, uh, for the first month, it was really funny to have your video conference while your child is climbing all over you. But it's now actually getting tiresome. So I don't know. Maybe we'll just switch back to normal because what I what I what I'm hearing from people many people are just waiting for you know for the for the bell for the final bell so we can get back to business as usual of course hopefully the economy won't be impacted as much and that's the thing that nobody knows right yeah. uh yeah the, the, uh, i'm, I'm a great fan of, of nothing taleb and yeah all the economists are well yeah so thank you thank you so much Igor we really appreciate that uh, uh, you know you, you bring uh, some really interesting points on the dynamics of working from home and the impacts to 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 everyday life and, and Roderick uh, I, I learned from you you have some experience about this whole working from home thing uh, now can, can, can we talk a little bit about the complexities that you've had to face and, and how, how you've dealt with it yeah, so so with the with the COVID nineteen, we really did, hadn't, hadn't had any change in our lifestyle because we were already operating a family enterprise or a number of enterprises from home. We we were determined a few years. We made a determined decision to get out of this system uh, of you know the the nine to five, paying bills on a thirty month basis, being rushed into you know the rigor of of, of life, the dependencies on these systems of things that we that we depended on. So um, it was also because my sons were, were growing up, they were uh, in adulthood. Uh, I taught them how to program from the age of 12 to PCs and things like that. So I didn't re realize that they'd actually embrace technology. My wife also loves it. And so as a family, we, we then decided, we partnered with uh, families. We chose specifically to partner and network with family values-based people that shared the same values that we had about building enterprises that were legacies. We were building it for the next generation, our children. So we didn't have this like, um, uh, we didn't represent a, a kind of business that was looking for the big, the next Facebook type of thing. We built our digital platform where we knew we had a lot of time. We, we, we focused on a 10 to 20 year project to, to basically build this for our children. And um, so, so our approach, we kind of took an organic, natural uh, living kind of thing already. So, so when this came along, other than um, you know limiting the way we, we shop and, and go out, 
it really hasn't really impacted us as much. Um, the things that I see people grappling with, you know, the adjustment work going from office to home are things that, you know, I, I still probably, we still probably grapple with. It's just that it's so, so normalized for us now that um, we just adjusted to it. So I, I think that in that way, we, we probably represent a lot of people that will probably find unemployed, they're unemployed, they get retrenched, what do they do? And um, those are the kind of things that, that I think, whereas we might have been a few year, decades ago, the, the minority of people, um, I think more than 50% of the people in the world may be in the same situation as you are. Okay. So let's let's jump to Shalini and 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 Alex. I know you have uh, some some questions and in uh, and thoughts, but Shalini, uh, what what are your thoughts on on on, on, on Roderick's uh, contribution? No, I think um, he's absolutely right that for some people who have had many years of experience of working home, this is still a continuation of their past experiences. Uh, one of the things I'd like to speak about is, uh, you know, what we're seeing here in India as a consequence of this, because uh, some of you might know that India has had, I think, one of the strictest lockdowns globally. So it's now 40 days and uh, 42, 43 days. And uh, the lockdown has meant uh, across the country, uh, you pretty much had to stay wherever you were. So, you know, if you were working in another city, then you had to stay on in that city till you know the lockdown eases, uh, which has, uh, I think, for the very first time, uh, brought a lot of consciousness of how many people are actually you know migrant laborers, if you like, or people who aren't um, you know city inhabitants but have come to cities, leaving their families behind because. Um, uh, most of the migrant labor uh, works in jobs which are blue collar jobs and they come to um, you know construction work or factory work or um, you know a street vendor those are the kind of jobs which uh, you know they typically operate in and uh, obviously in a lockdown the first thing that goes is anything that gives them employment which in India, I think, has really exposed the huge divide. Because if you talk about experiences in the lockdown, I think the experiences are so dramatically different depending on where you are. So if you are somebody, as you know, Roderick said, who's been a white collar, or like me, you know, I've been a consultant for three years. So mm -hmm. this is not something new. I have a home office. It's uh, the only difference is that now my whole family is at home. Earlier it was just me. So that, yeah. that's, but that's a difference. But on the other hand, if you talk to people whose uh, livelihood has gone, um, their savings are gone, they're stuck in a city away from their family, and they are, they're really worried because um, you know, uh, they don't know when this is going to end and what it's going to mean for them and their families financially. It's a completely different experience. Uh, the other thing, um, this has done is, uh, you know, and this is again along the lines of exposing the divide, is that as education has gone online, so schools have gone online, um, colleges have gone online. Uh, obviously, the only people who can go online are those who have, um, you know, who have a laptop and internet, right? So if you don't have a laptop and internet, and you're not going to a school or a college which has the capacity to go online then your education has stopped practically. So uh, I think one of the uh, biggest, uh, shall I say, experiences in India in has been that we are living, and we were always living in different worlds, but now the worlds are so sharply apart because uh, if you are, you know, say in the bottom third economically in, in the country, then that means that at this point, there's almost nothing for you. There's no, there's no work. There is no education. So there's really nothing for you. Okay. So, uh, Shalini, what, what does that say? Sorry, hold on. No, no, no. Uh, what, what does that say for the responsibility, the perceived responsibility, for those members of our society that um, have those choices versus those who do don't have those choices or whose choices are much more constrained? 
You know, that's a really good question because um, the truth is that, you know, people within the, shall I say, advantaged section of society, it's a huge range. So there are people who are like people everywhere else in the world, primarily concerned with their own family and their own life. And, you know, life goes on. The world is their family, their career, which is, I think, so, large. Yeah. But there are really? sections people who are, um, uh, you know, really, really working at providing services. So I, one surprising statistic is that the amount of help provided by private citizens and NGOs is much more than the collective effort of the government. Yeah. So, so, so Shalini, <laughs> really appreciate that the, the, the contributions. David, you were talking about the second and the third waves of, of consequences. Uh, with, with everything we're, we're, we're chatting about here, um, so what, what are your views? Well, I, I might be just picking up a, a little piece on the Indian experience and, and also looking at what those second and third order consequences might be further along the line. There, there's a couple of potentially relevant things going on. Uh, in the UK, and I suspect across much of Europe today, we're celebrating Victory in Europe Day. Uh, it's actually a bank holiday here. Uh, and so we remember that it's. Um, 75 years since the end of the Second World War in Europe, at least. Um, what happened at the end of the Second World War in the UK was that Winston Churchill, the great wartime leader, was kicked out. Right? The, the guys came back from war and they voted in the most socialist government in history, which gave us the NHS, which gave us free education right up to university level, which gave us great homes for uh, heroes returning from war. And I wonder whether there might be a moment in how we are all being hit globally, um, economically, very deep. I, I worry about India in particular, not simply for the bottom third, but for the middle third too, because uh, one of the consequences of COVID is that we will seek to automate everything we can to reduce costs. And a massive part of the Indian economy is in some of those service industries where automation is gonna decimate jobs and wealth. I say decimate, that's one in 10, it's probably worse than that. Um, so I think there's a there's a, a reckoning coming where we have to recognize how much do we care about our fellow people? How much do we value our place in society globally? And I think we start moving into some of the discussions potentially around uh, sustainability, not just in terms of um, whether you can sustain your business till the next year, but what the role of a business is in an economy which is reconfigured to create a safe and just space for humanity. So it's this idea from Donut Economics, uh, which has driven uh, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that the role of the economy is not to create um, GDP, uh, it is to create a safe and just space for humanity. So then we ask ourselves, what's the role of a government in that? What's the role of uh, a company in that and what's the role of us as individuals in that we're not just here to create cash right we're, we're here to achieve something that is sustainable and just and safe for humanity one of the uh, correlations there is that right now we're seeing warnings that um, COVID-19 isn't over until it's over for everyone so just because mm -hmm. we might clear it out of one country or Mm -hmm. come out of lockdown slightly in one country uh you know the uk is doing a fantastic job at, at uh knocking off as many people as we possibly can in one go it seemed um the the next step if we try to come out of lockdown even if we felt safe even if new zealand which has done such a fantastic job shut its borders what did it do for the next 18 months you know or what does it do if a vaccine is not invented because that's a real a real possibility and if we don't get a vaccine, we have to think culturally what it is to be human in the future, just as we've stopped grooming each other in the street. And that was something we used to do you know, several thousand years ago that we actually groom each other. Um, we, well, we groom each we other might, in other ways now through social media and whatnot, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, actually Why? the physical contact, <laughs> physical contact of, of right. grooming uh, was something very natural and normal for humans. Uh, and of course, I was just thinking about this earlier. You know, if if you get to a place where you cannot get a vaccine, we have to act differently as humans, which means 
well, we don't kiss, we don't hug, we don't shake hands, we don't share. But there used to be this thing about around the world, we have different uh, social spaces, yeah? So in, in different cultures, uh, it's more comfortable for people to be within a certain, just in the West, we tend to have a little bit more space. In the East, we tend to be quite comfortable being a little closer. Um, but maybe that's the new rule for humanity. It's a culture, social space is now two meters. It's been, <laughs> that's the edict. And that's the way it's gonna be from now on. Sure. So it's uh, massively impactful, I think. I think um, Roderick's from a part of the world that actually has some historical experience with social spaces being very, very strictly defined with regards to, you know, the greater society. Um, is there anything, any lessons you can give us from that history, Roderick, that can apply to what David said? Yeah, so um, I was trying to, uh, one of the points actually, um, listening to Charlie, um, talk about the background around India actually there's a concept that I that I teach my wanted to teach my kids from an early age which was the concept of the power of nothingness and uh, the it's it's not minimalism which is more aesthetic but the concept of actually being able to live with nothing and, and start from nothing and that basically was the way I grew up my parents were missionary doctors and that's how they came to Africa and we do a lot of social community-based work for social entrepreneurs. Uh, I've, I did um, for a long time apprenticeship program to teach kids when I was in lecturing at the university to train them how to teach them how to program and get jobs. Uh, so I taught them software programming and, and incubating them to get to get work, giving them opportunities. And then when my sons got to that age, I, I moved focused on them as well. Um, but the concept of, of nothingness, where we historically we have we have such a huge, I think we have the biggest one of the biggest um, inequality gaps, um, and yet if you go into the townships or poorer communities, it's not as if the economy doesn't exist there. There's a cash-based uh, economy that that thrives, and there's such resilience. If you think of other um, immigrants from other parts of, of Africa that come to South Africa. They come with nothing, and they and yet they they eventually they thrive. They they work hard, and so this anti-fragility concept of actually for me is it's an anti-fragile concept of of almost breaking yourself down already. And if you go take that and you say, okay, what is the worst case scenario for me? And I've always felt that there's only two, there's really two types of people that in in terms of work there are people that that require employment, and they are already they pay taxes, they're in the system, they have uh, accounts where they get into debt, they have credit, they, they, they can get a, uh, a house or a car, they can mortgage. Then there are those, the second, the other part of the people are really the same, they're the rich and the poor. Um, so the, the rich can be poor, the poor can be rich. If you're an entrepreneur, you know that, you can have nothing, you can have a lot. You move between those spaces of, 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 of really being in the lowest levels of poverty to the highest levels of wealth. That's that's because you're entrepreneurial, and that's the, something you accept as an entrepreneur. Um, that you have, you can have nothing at any given point, and you can lose everything. That's the risk. So imagine if most of the people were self-sufficient. If instead of having 50% unemployment, people that were unemployed just didn't consider being employed. They became, they they could have the skills, artisan-based work or uh, digital skills or other skills. That would make them self-sufficient. So instead of being see, seeing themselves as being unemployed, they actually just survive. They they learn to survive under the conditions that they're in. And I think with COVID-19, the the world we're going to get into after this is going to be force people to actually just survive. They're going to be resilient. They're going to have to find new skills. They're going to have to develop. So for me, it's yes, there's a lot of inequality, but there's a lot of life and resilience in, the, in that level of poverty. Many of the people that you see struggle will break down those barriers, whether it's, it's spatial divides or anything like that. And the, the key thing for us is how can we transfer the skills that we have, the resources we have, how can we share them to actually help people get out and to have the power to actually do whatever they want um, and to get out of the positions that they're in. It's not just necessarily higher education. It could be very, you know, people, I've, Heard lots of academics say, you know, in a knowledge-based economy, you don't need skills like welding or carpentry. Of course, you need them. My my sons are building IoT digital skills, and they're building stuff with artisan-based work. There's no blue-collar, mm. white-collar work. You just do the, the maker work. movement. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, working from home, I'm a, I'm, I'm a cook, I'm a dishwasher, I'm yeah. everything. If yeah. people are more like that, and we can train young people especially to be skilled that way, to have the soft skills as well as the technical skills, then maybe they won't be looking for a job. Maybe they'll just find a right. way to get through. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, Roderick, it sounds like it, it's a wholesale, nothing less than a wholesale redefinition of how people view or their relationship with work. And Igor, I was curious, what what do you see as like what road? Where does that take us in terms of what you uh, do? I, yeah, I'm. But actually, actually, I'd like to step in after Roderick because uh, he mentioned gaining skills. But the other important part for people to actually maybe try to leverage again because we kind of lost it, I think, it's community. Uh, yeah. Because this is really anti fragile. I mean, uh, <laughs> I must admit, I'm a little bit of this prepper guy. You don't see it, but I have some <laughs> boots stuck on the closet right behind me. I have some water and stuff. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I read the book by a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, the guy's name is Neil Strauss. And uh, the book is Emergency. The book, the book title is Emergency. And basically, he tells his story how amongst, I think, 10 or so years, he became a really like full-blown prepper. He learned how to shoot, how to skin a goat. He actually acquired a passport of St. Kitty's uh, as a place, like, like a bug out place to go in case of war or something like that. Uh, and the book tells the whole story, but uh, the epilogue, I mean, like the, like, the, like the final thought is amazing because in the very end, he joined many uh, community organizations in LA where he lives, uh, like to help, help the fire department, to help the, some some local health force, healthcare, uh, and he had this revelation. Like, I mean, my tools, my skills don't matter as much as the people I know. Because when the apocalypse comes and I have like this perfect house, the other people will just come and raise it. And, and take all, all the stuff I, I, I've, I've stuck there. But if I know I have I, if I know good people, nice people with skills, with community, uh, then it's perfect. Then it's like then 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 it's then then I'm really like uh, safe, kind of safe. Yeah. And that's actually the point that actually that also Nassim Taleb uh, has in Anti Fragile. Like he tells you that whenever you have the choice between reading a book and going to a random party, go to a random party because you can meet somebody interesting. So if you got a skills and if you know people who can maybe, you know, advertise you uh, or spread a word about you or, or something like that, then I think, so I think it might, might, might work, might work better. And that's actually what's happening now because uh, what you've mentioned, uh, Shani, uh, that in India more contribution is being made by the by the actually NGOs or by organized Absolutely. people than, than by the government. That's pretty much the same what's happening here in Poland. That people yeah. are producing masks or and other protection stuff, uh, while the government provides. Well, okay, let's not get into what government provides. But, but 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 you make <laughs> a good point there. The, the state the state should only really be the last catch-all. You should have yeah. family, communities, whatever based networks that you have, and mm -hmm. friends, and then an ideal state would be would be or situation would be where the state has the very few. But if 90% of the society is dependent on the state, it's going to break down, and that's what we're seeing yeah. as anti-fragile in our yeah. world. And so the most strongest thing that we can actually build is actually our communities, ourself, our families, our extended communities, and and yeah, that's a great, great, great point. I agree to um, a great extent. The only thing I think state itself is actually pretty anti-fragile. Um, I see companies, for example, going bust left, right and centre. Uh, I don't see states breaking right now. And I, it's because they are actually community writ and large when they're functioning at their best. They are a platform for us to mobilise our communities. And I'll give you another example of why the state shouldn't be undervalued. It takes something like a state to put, even now, a man on the moon. Uh, we still haven't seen the market manage that. And we have, certainly haven't seen community manage that. But there is still this 
this role for when it really comes to something significant to happen together, the state has to step in. And that's what we've seen in lockdown. You can compare and contrast the different versions of how the state has done that around the world. You look at Sweden to New Zealand to you know, the UK's own uh, amusing response. But it took the state to take to say something, to gather the information in the first place. It's actually been, in the UK, it's been driving a huge amount of innovation. Uh, it's been creating platforms for people to come and respond to crises. And of course, all the companies are doing all the work and all the, the smart people are working in the companies. And actually there's a risk in the way that small C conservative governments respond to this crisis because guess what? They're all trying to get back to normal. Right? So they're trying to introduce rescue packages to go backwards rather than drive us forwards at this point, which is a whole other story. You know, when we were thinking about our conversation, I was just reflecting on what has what would you know pass the test of anti-fragility in the institutions I'm aware of. And a couple of interesting examples, um, uh, it was the courts have now gone online and uh, you know our own judicial system there's much left to be desired but uh, because courts have gone online uh, i mean it's, it's almost unimaginable that uh, an institution which has you know had so much historical baggage also um, managed to transition um, I, I mean, seemingly smoothly, I don't know the details, but seemingly smoothly. And that opens out the door for a very, very different way of functioning as we go ahead. So that was really one interesting example. Another example which um, you know, is interesting is that uh, because in this lockdown, the only thing allowed are essential supplies and we need therefore a lot of coordination between different agencies uh, private, public, states, uh, central government, etc. Uh, and what would perhaps not have happened as readily in normal circumstances, the creation of, uh, you know, virtual meetings, meeting, uh, virtual committees, meeting virtually, um, uh, you know, often, uh, we've seen that happen. So government has gone online, uh, it's allowed, um, you know, so many players to meet at a frequency which perhaps I'm not sure we would have seen in other circumstances. So that the courts, um, you know, it, it's quite interesting that uh, the courts moved so seamlessly to online clearings. So, so Shalini, have you, have you seen medicine do the same in India? No. Not, a, not that I am aware of, at least not in a significant amount, you know, manner that would be spoken of. No, not really. And do you think that's directly related to those opportunities and those choices that we were talking about before? No, I'll tell you what, um, for medicine, in fact, for the last two years, there have been these um, huge initiatives, which are still really at their infancy, because the challenge in India is that the uh, doctors or the medical community is very largely concentrated in the cities, whereas the population is not. And um, it is, you know, it's, it doesn't help anybody if people, you know, from villages have to travel to a city for anything complicated. So there have been these initiatives, actually, some of which are run by the Tata Group as well, to have. Um, you know, these mural centers where uh, there are virtual uh, consultations with doctors in, uh, you know, urban uh, centers. Um, but I think it's still early. We haven't seen much of that. Maybe 40 days is still too early. And, you know, our lockdown challenge has been, our lockdown has been really strict. So um, that's meant movement has been very restricted. So I think other than people who have gotten passes for moving out. So, you know, you get passes if you are providing an essential service or or you're helping in the community in some way. So, you know, if you're a dog feeder, for instance, because we have a large uh, dog population, right? Street dogs, for instance. 
you can get a pass. So like our family is a street dog feeder. So we have the street dog feeder pass, which allows us to step outside the house and you know, feed, feed dogs. So it's not so simple to do anything. You know, I, I think in the last 40 days, which requires so much coordination amongst cities, small towns, and villages. It's, it's, a, it's not a small group, it's a very large group that needs to come together for this to come to life. But I'm sure that that has to be the future because nothing else makes sense. So, so it, and, and thank you, Shalini. And then taking that, that, that bet that you, that you just talked about it, as we look into the future, it's really a question for the, for the whole panel. I, I, I know that you have, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, or really broad perspectives around this. How do we move into the future? What are, what are the things we, we need to start thinking about? Uh, from a, from a societal standpoint, um, the contributions that uh, corporations or companies or businesses, uh, regardless of size, can 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 provide. How do we move into the future? It's, it's really a question for 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 all of you guys. Yeah, can can I start some... with a practical one? Um, I think there is uh, the the rush back to the office is going to happen, right? So. What we have to take into account is what the benefits are of um, working from home and what the benefits are of working from the office. And I think uh, it's incumbent on us to help as many people as possible to stick with working from home in order to allow those that can't work from home to do so in safety. That's our kind of first priority. And one of the ways we can we tackle that is that we have to. Um, find ways to reflect what the benefits are we get of the office life and virtualize them digitally. Now that might be, how do I get that me time? How do I make sure I get enough exercise in a day? Because if you're sat in the office, or sat at home all the time, you, you don't move around, but you tend to do 10, 15,000 steps a day just moving around London. Um, how do I recognize that the time that I'm going to spend, if I work out and I, you know, maybe it's just, making sure you understand of all your people, what they get from each of the scenarios, the work from home, the work in the office. If we work out that there are parts of that day that must be in a shared space and time, then plan how we use that much shorter space and time much more effectively. So if you come in into the office, we're doing so because we're gonna share a load of ideas. We're doing so because we're gonna spend time um, actually doing all of that kind of social stuff or the leadership stuff that we think is important about office life and plan it rather than just everyone go to their desks and carry on as normal. So I think there is a way we can help people actually make practical steps to improve that experience and the result will actually be a better way of working for all of us uh, but it also fixes some of the challenges that we have in terms of uh, moving people through the shared space of the the tubes and the, the, the underground network and the, and the trains that will otherwise be insurmountable and would prevent the people that do need to physically be there from doing that in safety. I, I think there's there's a whole intrinsic process um, that people are going through. It's like the movie The Matrix where you get the blue pill and the red pill. And this is COVID op has given us that opportunity to take the red pill or the blue pill. And we're gonna go back and we're gonna decide, do we go back? Does the nine to five kind of work? Does employment work for me, for my family? People are gonna reflect on that um, because they're gonna start valuing certain things that they may not have appreciated as much as before, the time that they spend with their families and so forth. And they may re-architect and redesign their lifestyle based on, on, on this experience. So that would be the interesting thing for me if that becomes a revolution or a movement. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I have maybe a philosophical insight uh, that we as a society, maybe we should learn more to let go and embrace things as, as they are. Because uh, on a previous panel, I've heard this once again, this great insight that, well, speaking from the system theory point of view, it's normal that some things just die or have to go away. And what, what I'm seeing currently, at, at least in my country, from say, from economic perspective, that the government is, well, being called 
upon to save everybody, everyone, all the businesses. And uh, while I'm very sympathetic towards this small bar that's like the opposite, on the opposite side of the street, I don't know if this big fancy restaurant should be saved if, mm -hmm. if, if, if it's got problems. And if we try to save everything and everybody, we're going to end up in printing money, in hyperinflation and, and everything's going to go bust. So, so, so from economical standpoint, this, this letting go, this embracing the, well... Or, or just from an the, opportunity the, cost perspective, the, you're spending mm -hmm. resources to try and prop up something that's just going to die anyway. You know, you're yeah, putting but, it on life support. Yeah, but m many people just don't understand it. They just want their life back now. As it was, you yeah. have a thought. Everything, mm -hmm. and f but but there are many things that are maybe better. Just for instance, my gym is closed, and I found out this great uh, gal on the internet uh, who does yoga online, and I totally love her. And well, it's it's it's, it's also <laughs> okay. And I maybe won't go uh, for holiday to US, India, Australia, or whatever. But I will just go to our local mountains, and that's also great. But and I've seen many more and more people actually embracing the situation, but still lots of people are just holding on to the old and they just believe that we're gonna sit through the lockdown and we're just gonna leave our uh, homes and it's gonna be like just like the old times. And the government should uh, prevent an anything from, you know, from failing. So Shalini, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I think this is not a very simple, um, uh, you know, Obviously, it's not a simple conversation, but I'll tell you what's really uh, confounding um, where we are. One is, of course, the COVID challenge. But the COVID challenge comes just at the time when uh, digital technologies are taking off. And just like Igor said, that you know he has had the option of going to earlier a physical gym, and now he's moved to an online teacher. Now, the thing which makes any digital platform or technology-based business so profitable is its scale, right? That you can, you know, offer your service to whatever. There's almost no upper limit sometimes on how many people can join an online yoga class, for instance, as much as the platform will, you know, allow. Uh, but, the, you know, what's really worrisome about that is that um, the jobs, in fact, like, in fact, let's talk about gyms because that's a real example, right? So gyms are closed, uh, I think, in many, many parts of the world. Um, and even in India, for instance, some of the big chains, which uh, say the one, the biggest one, which has, say, I think, 260 centers across the country, uh, the next day, pretty much, it, um, it had a good digital platform. And it hadn't picked up as much, but the moment uh, you know, the lockdown was announced, actually, pretty much overnight. So uh, overnight, its online classes became the primary, um, you know, method of. But what that also means is that a lot of jobs are going to be impacted because if you compare the number of people you need to teach online classes, whatever number you say, like one 20, person can teach ten million people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, going to happen to so many other people. So the very factors which make a digital technology so profitable as an entrepreneur and so exciting as an entrepreneur you know, uh, is scale. But along with scale is the fact that you need one person for maybe, like in gym, maybe one person for 50 instructors now. So what well, that's that also the same for educationalists now. Which is uh, the, the flip side, the positive that you you get from it. You get global education from one teacher. And so it's still, when, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah. physical geography, whatever other services which we used to, you know, the physical geography allow. You know, we went to our gym, we went to our local school. Whatever, you know, the moment that's moved digitally, as it's had to pretty much overnight across the world, uh, it means. There are going to be so many people who will be, you know, whose jobs are at least very tenuous at this point in time. It's still early to say, but I think it's safe to say that the future is going to be digital, which means that there are a whole number of jobs and of people who cannot really afford to lose their jobs. That's, so in a sense, I'm actually doubly worried because 
the COVID crisis and the fact that that's meant that certain professions cannot be done because you can't go out and do them, along with the adoption of digital technologies is going to um, amplify each other. So you are going to see inequality increase very, very sharply. The other thing about digital technologies is because they're so scalable. So if you're a good yoga teacher, for instance, you know, and you can have whatever, instead of 100 people, now you can teach 1,000 people. Uh, yep. Talent, good talent. So if you're excellent, you see, you attract a massive following. You could have even a million followers if you are, mm -hmm. you know, a yoga right. teacher. For and the flip side of that is diversity of teachers that are available to any single person. Absolutely. You're, you're not limited yeah. to whoever's in a five-mile radius. Yeah, and, and five minutes plus the panel. Feeding, feeding yeah, thank you. So, in 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 feeding back to the divide, uh, so uh, we we have to close up, right, Kelly? Um, yes. Yeah. All right. So so um, re really, uh, I mean, we could talk for for hours with 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 you all. Um, really appreciate your your insight and. Uh, some of the key things watch the divide how do we contribute how do, how do we contribute uh what final comments do we get from 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 you guys uh real quick uh, uh fire round if you will david so the <laughs> uh oh when oh, we go right. to igor when we go to igor Roger. All right, right, right. So, so the way the way people make the household income is going to change. You know, we're not going to rely on large sums of salaries. We're going to have to create multiple small revenue streams. We're going to have to look at different ways to make money. Um, and I think there's going to be something about the community-based economy. We have to subsidize people's data if we're going to have to do online stuff. And I think the com community economy is going to grow. Um, but there's going to be more annuity-based income. We're not going to sell ourselves on an hourly basis as much as we did before. David, uh, so, I'd, I'd add that okay. uh, I think going back is one of the greatest risks we face. Uh, in you know, we can argue whether COVID nineteen is a black swan or not, but it certainly had a negative impact. If you go back to normal, all you're doing is adding in all the old costs and all the old risks in order to not take advantage of the bounce back that is the other black swan that we can see in clear view. There will be an explosion in the economy next year. Now, can we be ready for it? Or should we just hunker down and cut away and throw jobs and lives away in the meantime so that you're not ready to grow next year in the explosion that's gonna come? I think that is absolutely crazy, but we're seeing loads of it. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, I, I think I can consider us all here on this panel as kind of influencers, right? So I see uh, this, this difficult time as kind of also a window of opportunity for us uh, to actually ev evangelize more people because what I, I'm also conducting, say, anti-fragility workshops and I'm seeing now an influx of people and they are actually way more open to, to listen, to, uh, to hear me out about the volatility that, that, uh, that's, that surround us, uh, about the fact that we, sh we should embrace this reality, not just turn the blind eye uh, and we should try to live with that, move on as, I, as I've mentioned previously. So I, my final thought would be evangelize others about, about gray rhinos, black swans <laughs> and address that, that, that this is our reality and we just have to face it and move on. Yeah. Uncertainty opens minds, absolutely. And uh, Cellini, I think we have uh, left. Yeah, I think uh, the future has certainly been fast forwarded in many, many ways uh, by the digital technology adoption, which has been you know, pretty much overnight. I think we haven't as societies, and I'm not just going to say our country, but I think it's true across the world. Uh, we haven't really gone through the process of finding answers to some very fundamental questions like what are we going to do when you know digital technologies are going to expose divides like never before what are we going to do when the inequality increases much more sharply what are we going to do when there aren't going to be enough jobs so there's lots of fundamental questions which are unanswered but the time has come much sooner than perhaps pre-covid thank you thank you thank you everyone and thank thank you for your time thank love, you. love your your thank you, everyone. Thank you.